So to start us off, we are very, very happy uh, to have one of the most influential researchers in asset pricing and competition, uh, Ralph Kojan from University of Chicago booth. And he will give us introductory remarks and set the stage for today's topic. Uh, Ralph, uh, I'll turn it over to you now and you have 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks so much uh, um, for the kind words. So, so can you see my screen? Yes, great. Okay. Okay, well, thanks so much for um, for the opportunity to provide some uh, opening comments. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, so what I will do is I will sort of like try to give a little bit of perspective from my view in terms of like where demand system asset pricing fits in, um, in sort of standard macro finance and asset pricing. Um, then I'll think a little bit about sort of like under what conditions um, does data on, on portfolio holdings, which is what we're going to sort of look at today, sort of like does it sort of like add additional information and then I'll touch on sort of like, like a, a series of questions in different literatures where I think demand system asset pricing could, could, could be useful. So, so just to get started, um, when we think about sort of like what we typically do in, in asset pricing and macro finance, then given like investors' preferences and endowments technology and so on, asset pricing models imply asset demand curves. And then we impose market clearing and outcome, outcome asset prices. So in, in a way, like all of asset pricing is, is demand-based demand -based asset pricing. Now, once we bring those models to the data, though, like econometric tests, sort of what they typically do is they connect asset prices to, to state variables and, and their innovations to see like which shocks are priced uh, and which sort of like which state variables capture fluctuations in investment opportunities. And so, so what, what the goal is, I think, of demand system asset pricing is to also, in addition, match uh, data on investor level portfolio holdings. OK, and I want to emphasize that this idea of using portfolio holdings is actually not new at all. Um, so if you go back to the 60s and I don't know, to 80s, there was actually a very sort of active literature with contributions by Brainerd, Frankel, uh, Friedman, and Dobin, among others, that used demand systems to, to, um, to study some of, these, some of these questions. Now, it may be useful to take a step back and sort of think, well, what were sort of like the, the obstacles in the early literature and why is now a particularly good time to revisit that approach? And so I think there's like at least three reasons. First, there was sort of very limited high quality data on portfolio holdings. And I think what the two papers today illustrate is that we now have a wealth on, on, of, of data on institutional holdings across countries, across asset classes. Um, and sort of excitingly, also now we sort of learn more about sort of the, the household sector and what their portfolio holdings look like. And I think that's extremely valuable. Secondly, so if you look at sort of the kinds of models that, that the earlier literature estimated is they were like very, very flexible. So you think of like, think of like a vector of portfolio holdings that were then explained by, um, by expected returns and, and other variables and there were lots of parameters. And so what sort of like the, 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 the recent literature does is to, to really use like factor models and, and, and use this characteristics-based demand system to sort of like, like make this much more parsimonious and more tractable to estimate. And then the third sort of like, like obstacle in the early literature, I think, was identification. So if you look at the econometric tools that were used, it was either I don't know, simply OLS or, 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 or additional restrictions being imposed. And so what you see there is that, that sort of the estimates that they got were quite, um, um, quite unstable, unidentified. And if you impose like additional restrictions like mean variance preferences, then you're really sort of like imposing a lot of restrictions on substitution patterns, which are quite important. And so in recent years, we've seen a lot of sort of like, like creative new instruments that, that have been proposed in the literature. And of course, a lot more work can be done there. Um, but at least I think we have more reliable estimates than, than what we used to have. Okay, and so given all that, it seems sort of natural to revisit that, that approach and to see what we can learn from that. Now, what I want to do then is sort of, sort of think about sort of like under what conditions do we actually learn something from holdings data beyond prices and, and macro variables and, and characteristics? And for what kind of questions are our demand systems uh, potentially useful? And then like what, what kind of like, like lessons can we learn for, for theory? And so let me start with the first with the first question. So when do holdings data contain additional information? So I'm going to impose a little bit of structure just to sort of like, like, like make, that, make that point. So consider like a demand curve of investor I. So QI is my demand for like a given stock or, or the market, um, um, uh, whatever you, you, you prefer. Um, think of QI bar sort of like your average sort of like demand for a particular stock if you're in steady state. Now a little QI is sort of the demand deviation. Think of it as like rebalancing in response to new information and prices. And so, so QI over here is going to respond to prices. Zeta over here is the demand elasticity. Okay, and so the second paper today is going to sort of think very carefully about how to model that demand elasticity. 
UI is a demand shock that tells you something about sort of expected future growth. It could be sentiment, risk preferences, any of those, any of those forces. And so, so you impose market clearing. So the size weighted average of demand across all investors has to be equal to zero for every buyer there's, there's a seller. And out of this simple structure, two equations come that are, that are sort of useful to look at for a second to understand when portfolio holdings could be useful. So the first one is that price changes or returns are equal to those demand shocks scaled by that elasticity. And the demand of a given investor, uh, the rebalancing of a given investor is that investor's demand shock relative to the size weighted average demand shock of all the other, all the other investors. Now, that elasticity in standard models data over here is like really, really high. And so what that implies is that demand shocks, which are equal to that elasticity times returns has to be like really volatile. Okay. The second sort of uh, observation is that in the data, portfolio holdings don't change all that much from one period to the next. And I'm going to revisit that in, in a second. Now, what does that mean? Is that if, if this aggregate demand shock is very volatile, but the left hand side here is not very volatile, it means that sort of like, like investors kind of have to agree on, on demand shocks. And so that means that investors have to agree on, on, on um, unexpected growth rates, shocks to risk preferences, things like that. And so in that case, if, if, if these demand shocks are virtually the same, looking at price, at, at, at price changes or any information from holdings contains very little additional information. Now, what is sort of then critical is to get a feeling for like what Zeta or what the demand analysis actually is empirically. And so, so here I'm gonna sort of draw a little bit on the work that, that Moto Yogo and I did. Um, and sort of we documented two facts, which I think are, are underlying the, the elasticity estimates that the literature has, has found. First of all, portfolio holdings, as I mentioned, are not particularly volatile. And so you can see that like characteristics are changes, prices are changing, but portfolio holdings don't respond all that, all that much. Now that in and of itself may be fine. There's lots of models where there's like no rebalancing whatsoever. But then there's a second fact that seems to sort of like, like um, be perhaps more challenging, which is that if you look at the portfolios, they actually deviate a lot from the market portfolio. So a typical institution holds something like 60 stocks. The weights that they hold are very different from, from, from standard market weights. And so that looks very active, but then in response to changes in investment opportunities, they're not rebalancing their portfolios all that, all that much. Okay, and that's sort of like suggestive that perhaps demand is more inelastic. Now, of course, there's like a lot of work on, on formal estimates of, of demand elasticities. And so I'm gonna sort of put it as price impact, so one over the elasticity. And, and I'm going to sort of, as a point of reference, think about sort of like what theory implies as, as well. And so, so if you go to like the level of individual stocks, then you see that that theory predicts a price impact that's essentially essentially zero. If you go to the to the to the data, then the estimates sort of they vary a, a, across papers, across methodologies, but order of magnitude, you can think about like like price impact of being one or slightly slightly higher. And so, so that's sort of like a deviation from standard theories of like several orders of magnitude. Now with that lower elasticity or higher price impact, starting to look at uh, sort of like, if you start looking at, at demand, there's like additional information in there. You can also look at the level of factors and sort of what theory predicts is that like if, 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 if any two investments are like less close substitutes, then price impact should be, should be higher. And consistent with that, sort of like what the recent literature finds is that if you compare like let's say like 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 value versus size and, and things like that, you get price impact measures that are order of magnitude higher, like or, or substantially higher, like order of magnitude like five. And so that means that if you buy one percent of a given factor, you're going to move prices by five percent. You can also lift it to the level of the aggregate market. Again, standard models are very elastic, so that means that the price impact that you estimate or that that the model suggests you uh, you should find is something like one over twenty. Empirically, you see that those essence again are substantially higher. Different countries, different methodologies, but again, far from what theories predict. Now that's sort of like an important upside of that. So that means that if markets are indeed sort of like inelastic, then you can sort of extract additional information from portfolio holdings beyond simply looking at prices. Okay, and so understanding like, like the matrix of different groups of investors becomes like a meaningful, a meaningful exercise. Okay, so with that in hand, so let me sort of like, like, like run through like a, a, a series of questions where I think demand systems could potentially be, be useful. So the first um, uh, area where I think sort of like using demand systems would be, would be valuable is in, in the area of, of belief. So there was a whole, I don't know, 
earlier mini conference on on the topic of beliefs, which is which is sort of very exciting. A lot of new work on that. What you could do sort of in that context is think about sort of like like what we currently do is we look at sort of survey expectations coming from analysts or from households, and then directly connect those to to prices. What you could do is you could ask the question like, okay, if there's different components in 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 the beliefs data, like how do they sort of like show up in 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 the holdings data? And to what extent are different investors paying attention to, to different analysts or share the same share the same views? And so that sort of like relates to the recent sort of like literature on the path through beliefs to actions, like so the interesting work by Stefano Giglio, uh, Matteo Maggiore, and Johanna Strobel, where they sort of like find that the path through from beliefs to actions seems to be quite quite muted. Okay, now in order to then get back to prices, one of the things that could be happening is that. You have like like a weak path through from 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 beliefs to actions, but if those like smaller demand shocks like hit in elastic markets, it could still move prices quite quite a bit. Okay, and so sort of like understanding sort of like the sort of like how we go from beliefs to prices seems like an interesting sort of direction to explore. The second sort of like like area where demand systems could be valuable is in is in the asset management the questions related to the asset management industry. And so we've seen large changes in the structure there. And the second paper today is sort of like a great example of, 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 of just that. Okay, so we see the rise of passive investing and we want to understand what does that do to the structure of the market. Similarly, there's a lot of like recent work on, on ESG investing, big shift in quantities, and we can explore sort of like how that impacts, impacts prices and, and expected returns. The third area where I think demand systems could be could be valuable is is in fixed income markets. So obviously, sort of like there's lots of quantity questions, sort of like in that in that literature. But currently, we're looking largely at largely at prices. I think. And so, for instance, in the context of unconventional monetary policy, if central banks sort of change either the amount of like long term or short term uh, bonds that it's holding, then the question is like how are investors substituting away from those from those securities, and how does it influence influence prices? At lower frequencies, there's of course a lot of discussion about sort of the decline in real interest rates, um, and some of the stories that are being sort of discussed, or some of the theories that have been proposed, relate to demand from like 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 emerging economies, and maybe sort of coming demand from like wealthy investors. And again, sort of like understanding quantitatively like how powerful these effects are, assuming sort of or using sort of like recent elasticity estimates seems like a useful a useful exercise. Now on the flip side, so that sort of interest rate declining. There's also a very active debate on, on fiscal capacity and debt valuation puzzles, where some are arguing that some of the fiscal variables that should matter for the valuation of government debt, the government debt are not sufficiently, sufficiently reflected in those, in those prices. By sort of like decomposing the valuations of, of government debt at the investor level or by different countries, you can sort of explore like, like which investors are not responding enough or at least responding in a different way compared to our theories um, to those to those variables. Okay, and again, if you then sort of like have that model and it sort of matches reasonable substitution patterns, you can also revisit questions about about fiscal fiscal capacity. The last area that I'll briefly mention where I think demand systems could be valuable is in the context of international finance. And so this again is an example where, like, if you think about the whole literature on convenience yields or the special demand for U.S. assets or dollar-denominated assets. Um, there's lots of like price effects that we that we know, but of course it would be interesting to understand sort of like who's driving that convenience yield, like which investors in which in which countries are the certain sectors that are are responsible for that. And again, sort of I think sort of having um, building out sort of demand systems in a global context could be valuable as as well. The last one that I'll mention is sort of the exchange rate disconnect, where like a growing literature adds like demand shocks. Uh, to explain fluctuations in exchange rates beyond beyond fundamentals. Now, once you sort of like bring in bring in portfolio holdings data, you can actually measure those demand shocks, understand its properties, like what are what is the correlation structure of those demand shocks, how persistent are they, and then we can actually calibrate those um, those international macro models to actual to actual data, and hopefully that sort of like guides guides future future work. Okay, so let me. Um, just as a, as a last slide, sort of like, like talk a little bit about, about asset pricing theory or macro finance theory. So I think sort of the new facts that have been documented sort of like, like um, uh, raise like a lot of interesting questions. So first of all, like we don't really know why demand is so inelastic. Um, and so in the paper with Xavier, uh, Gebex, we sort of explore some of these, um, but I think there's a lot more to be done. So 
It could be related to like institutional mandates. It could be like inertia, perhaps regulation plays a role. It could be risk constraints. Perhaps it's agency frictions. Perhaps it's very hard to estimate expected returns. And so I don't really know how much expected returns change. I'm not gonna change my portfolio all that, all that much. All of those are, are reasonable possibilities. And truly understanding why investors don't seem to respond very much to prices is, is an important question. Secondly, once you have sort of like, like once we sort of like think of, of inelastic markets, then so sort of the demand starts of different groups of investors become, become interesting. So instead of having like one big shock that moves everything up and down, we can now kind of unbundle that shock in a meaningful way and try to understand how demand shocks of different groups of investors start to start to matter. And so in it, we can hope and I hope hope to have some 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 way of like unbundling the dark matter in asset pricing and really go to the investor level and, and learn what what drives their uh, their demand shocks and, and flows. And then lastly, I think it's important to sort of develop these frameworks sort of like in, in, in a more dynamic dynamic setting, like, like the elasticity estimates that I showed you before, some of those are at fairly high frequencies, they use daily data, some of them use quarterly data. And so understanding how fast and slow traders interact, how important is inertia and things like that are like very meaningful questions, I think. And that of course, goes back to like the research agenda that Daryl Duffy set out to, uh, to explore in his presidential address and sort of like, Combining that with like realistic sort of like elasticity estimates, I think is very is a very exciting direction to to go as well. And so, I know from my perspective, given the wealth of new data that we have on holdings, new methods that we have, um, we can start to sort of like apply demand systems like across countries and across across asset classes, and and hopefully sort of learn a lot of new a lot of new facts and, and develop then new theories consistent with those with those facts. And I think the two papers today are like really fantastic examples of like what what one can do with that uh, and hopefully more to more to follow thank you